When I was 10 years old, my family moved to the U.S. from Ethiopia, and it was a whole new world for me. I loved everything about America, the opportunities, the culture, and the people. My dad was a successful businessman, so we lived a comfortable life, which made the transition even smoother. In high school, I met Sander, the guy who would eventually become my husband. We had a bit of an on-again, off-again relationship throughout those years. But when I turned 20, we decided to fully commit to each other and get married. I was over the moon with excitement, envisioning a future filled with love and happiness. However, there was one major hurdle, Xander's mother, Olive. She was not thrilled about our wedding plans. I couldn't help but suspect that her disapproval had something to do with my Ethiopian heritage. There were instances of microaggressions, those subtle comments and actions that left me feeling uneasy and unwelcome. But Sander was different. He didn't care about his mother's opinions. He loved me for who I was, not where I came from. Despite the tension with Olive, he stood by my side and made it clear that he was marrying me regardless of his mother's objections. Our wedding day was a mix of emotions. On one hand, I was thrilled to be marrying the man of my dreams, but on the other, I couldn't shake the feeling that Olive's disapproval was lingering in the background. I tried my best to focus on the love between Xander and me, pushing away any negative thoughts. In the days that followed, Olive's disapproval became more apparent. She made snide remarks about my culture and heritage, and it hurt. I wanted to have a good relationship with my mother-in-law, but it seemed like an impossible task. Xander tried to mediate, but it wasn't easy. He loved his mother, but he also loved me, and he didn't want to be caught in the middle. He assured me that he would talk to his mom, but things remained tense. As the months passed, Olive's microaggressions continued. She would make backhanded compliments, ask invasive questions about my background, and overall make me feel like an outsider in my own family. It took a toll on my mental and emotional well-being. Despite the challenges, Sandra and I tried to build a life together. We got a place of our own and focused on our careers and plans. But Olive's disapproval and microaggression still lingered, casting a shadow over our happiness. So one day, Olive's comments reached a boiling point, and I couldn't take it anymore. I had always tried to maintain my composure and be kind, but her hurtful words had finally pushed me over the edge. I shouted at her, something I had never done before. I let her know that I was tired of her microaggressions and how unwelcome she made me feel. It was a moment of release and I didn't hold back. You know, Olive, I've had enough of your constant comments. It's getting really old. Oh, I'm just stating my opinion. No need to get so defensive. Opinion? It feels more like you're constantly picking on me because of where I come from. I deserve respect just like anyone else. I don't mean to offend you, but you're so sensitive about everything. It's not about sensitivity. It's about respect. I'm your daughter-in-law and I deserve to be treated with kindness and understanding. Well, maybe if you tried to fit in a little more, I wouldn't have to say anything. Fit in? I've been living here for years. This is my home too, and I don't have to change who I am to please you. You know, I didn't ask for you to marry my son. I didn't want you to marry my son. I had different plans for him. And that's not fair. We love each other, and that should be all that matters to you. Maybe if you were from a more traditional background, I'd be more accepting. You know what? I don't need your acceptance. I'm proud of my heritage and I won't let you make me feel bad about it. Your ignorance is not my problem. Well, maybe if you had married someone from your own culture, things would be easier. That is not the point. We're married and you need to accept that. Your constant disapproval is hurting us and I won't let you ruin our happiness. I never thought you'd speak to me like this. Why are you being so aggressive? 
Maybe you never thought I'd stand up for myself, but I won't let anyone, not even you, tear me down. I'm done trying to please you. Fine. If that's how you feel, maybe we should just keep our distance. That's fine by me. I deserve to be surrounded by people who love and respect me for who I am. You're being so unreasonable. No, I'm just tired of being treated poorly. I'm your family now, and it's time you started treating me like it. If you can't do that, then maybe it's best if we keep our distance. Suit yourself. I will, thank you, and I hope you take some time to reflect on your behavior and how it's affecting your relationship with your son. I'm going to go now. Maybe when you're ready to treat me with respect, we can talk again. Until then, take care. After that, I left the room, feeling a mix of anger and sadness. It was hard to confront Olive like that, but I knew I had to stand up for myself. I knew my relationship with her was strained from that point on, perhaps beyond repair. But I knew I had made the right decision. I deserved to be treated with respect and I wasn't going to tolerate any more microaggressions or hurtful comments. My focus was on my marriage and building a happy life with Xander, regardless of Olive's disapproval. When I told Xander about the altercation, he surprised me by taking my side. He supported me and told his mom that she needed to treat me with respect. But then, things took an even more dramatic turn. Olive said that if that's how her son felt, she'd disown him too. It was a shock to Xander, and I could see the hurt in his eyes. His mother wanted to disown him because he stood up for his wife. It was heartbreaking to witness, but at the same time, it made us both realize something important. We didn't need toxic people in our lives, even if they were family. We deserved love and respect, and if someone couldn't provide that, then they didn't deserve a place in our hearts. As much as it hurt to see Olive act this way, it was a wake-up call for Xander. He quickly realized that his mother's disapproval and negativity were holding him back from being truly happy. It was time for him to break free from the toxicity and create a life with me that was built on love and understanding. Months had passed since Olive cut us out of her life and Xander was still deeply affected by his mother's decision. He missed her, despite all the hurtful things she had said and done. I wanted to help him find closure and maybe even a chance to reconcile, so I planned a dinner date at Xander's favorite restaurant. When we arrived at the restaurant and I gave my name, the maitre d' at the front desk puzzled and said my name was blacklisted. I was taken aback since we had been regular customers there. I asked to speak with the manager, hoping to sort out the confusion. To my surprise, the manager turned out to be Olive herself. During all those months of silence, turns out she had been busy acquiring more assets, and that included becoming a manager at this restaurant. Chili's, me and Xander's favorite place. And she knew that. Coincidence? I think not. Seeing her there, I couldn't help but feel a mix of shock and disbelief. How petty could she be? Well, 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 what do we have here? I never thought I'd see the day when you two would show up at my restaurant. Olive didn't hesitate to tell us that we were not welcome at her restaurant. Xander couldn't contain his emotions and started shouting at his mother, causing a scene in the restaurant. I was torn between wanting to support Xander and trying to keep the situation from escalating further. Olive, we didn't come here to cause trouble. We just wanted to have a peaceful dinner. Peaceful dinner? With the likes of you? I don't think so. You know, it's quite amusing to see you both standing there begging to be let in after what you did. What are you talking about, Mom? We've always loved this place and now you're telling us we're not welcome? Oh, it's quite simple. You see, when you decided to marry this, this person against my wishes, I had to make a choice. I couldn't have my son making such a terrible mistake, so I made sure to protect my business from your poor choices. You're so sick. It's disgusting. You're doing this on purpose, aren't you? 
You blacklisted us from your restaurant just to spite us. Oh, please, Xander. I'm just looking out for my reputation. I can't have people like you associating with my business. This is ridiculous, Mom. You're choosing your bigotry over your son. I thought you were better than this. You're the only one who made this choice, Xander. Don't blame me for your mistakes. At this point, practically everyone in the restaurant was looking at us. It was embarrassing to be thrown out of Chili's. Xander, it's not worth fighting with her. Let's go. You're right, Amara. She's not worth it. Yeah, go on. Get out of here. Nobody wants you here. So we left and started walking down the street, just wandering around. Xander was really upset, and I let him vent about how much he loved Chili's. Hey, it's going to be all right. Let it out. Tell me how you're feeling. It's just Chili's, you know? My dad and I used to go there all the time when I was younger. It was like our thing. We'd sit by the window, order our favorite dishes, and just talk about life. It was one of the few places where we could connect, you know? I know, babe. It sounds like such a special memory. I can't believe Olive dared to take that away from you. Yeah, and the worst part is that she knows how much it meant to me. She knows how much my dad meant to me. I can't believe she's doing all of this just because she doesn't like that I married you. It's not fair, Xander. You deserve so much better than this. I wish I could change things for you. I just hate that she's trying to ruin everything for us. I thought the family was supposed to support each other, not tear each other down. I know it's hard to understand why she's acting this way, but sometimes people let their prejudices cloud their judgment. We can't change that, but we can choose how we react to it. You're right. I don't want to waste any more time and energy on her. We have each other and that's what matters. That's the spirit. We'll get through this together and hey, I have a surprise that might cheer you up a bit. Oh, what is it? Well, turns out my dad owns the whole complex of buildings on this street, including Chili's. Wait, what? Why didn't you tell me this before? It was a recent business deal he made with some investors and I wasn't sure how it would all work out. I was going to tell you once we had sat down in the restaurant. Something to celebrate, you know. Amara, that's amazing. I need to pass on the congrats to him. You can do that later because right now we need to take care of your mom. What do you mean? I mean, my dad can handle this. He's not someone you want to mess with when it comes to business matters. He's going to sort Olive out and we won't have to worry about her anymore. At that moment, I decided to call my dad and let him know what happened. I put him on speaker so Xander could hear too. I told my dad everything about how Olive treated us at Chili's. Dad wasn't too happy to hear all of this, to say the least. I knew that lady hated you, but kicking you out of the restaurant was low. I'm so sorry I didn't see the documents sooner. You know, I only recently got the title deeds to this complex. I didn't have enough time to check out all of the managers, but now that I know about this, I have to deal with it immediately. He told me not to worry one bit because he was going to sort Olive out and give her a serious earful. He even said, Give me 30 minutes and I'll be on my way to personally sort this issue out. Hearing my dad say that made me feel a mix of relief and concern. I knew he could handle it, but I also was hoping things wouldn't get too messy. My dad is not someone you want to mess with, especially when it comes to business matters, and my dad was a firm believer in fairness and compassion when it came to customers. So there we were, Xander and I, waiting nervously for my dad to arrive at Chili's while we hung around the area. We didn't know exactly what he had in mind, but we trusted that he would handle things the right way. Moments later, dad arrived and we all walked in, following his confident stride, and I could already sense that something big was about to go down. He called out for Olive, loud enough for everyone in the restaurant to hear. I could feel the tension in the air as people turned to see what was happening. Olive stepped out, looking annoyed and probably thinking she could just dismiss my dad as she did with us. 
but Dad wasn't one to be dismissed so easily. He raised an eyebrow at her and said, Olive, my dear, it seems you haven't been keeping up with the latest news. Did they forget to tell you about the new owner of the third Blue Street complex? Olive looked taken aback, clearly not expecting this revelation. What are you talking about? Who is it? Dad smiled and revealed. Well, that would be me. I am the new owner, and I must say, I've been here for less than a week and already I'm hearing awful complaints about your management. Olive's face turned pale as she realized her mistake. I, I didn't know. Dad chuckled and said, Well, maybe if you had read your emails or paid attention to what's happening around you, you would have known, but it's too late to apologize now. I was so glad to see Olive get a taste of her own medicine. Xander stepped forward and said firmly, You had no right to treat us the way you did, especially Amara. We've always known that you've been a hateful person, but when it comes to owning an establishment, the first thing they should have taught you is that no one is discriminated against due to personal matters as a manager. You blatantly disregarded that, and I don't think you're the right fit for this place. Hakim, wait! I, I'm sorry, I didn't know. Even if you didn't know that he owned the place, you should have put your bigotry aside and served as rightful customers. Please, let's talk about this in the back. No need. I'm sure these lovely people would like to know that the racist bigot who was managing Chili's is no longer part of the staff. Everyone began murmuring louder than they already were. Olive looked so embarrassed, and Xandra and I were amused with ourselves, getting our justice after being abused for so long by her awful words. My dad kicked her out, threatening to get security to drag her out if she didn't want to cooperate. She was so ashamed she looked like she was about to cry, so she began her walk of shame outside. With Olive walking out, the atmosphere in the restaurant quickly changed. People started clapping and cheering as she walked out in shame and I couldn't help but feel a sense of relief and satisfaction. Xandra and I rushed over to my dad and hugged him tightly, thanking him for stepping in and helping us out. You're the best, Dad. Dad chuckled and patted both of us on the back. It was my pleasure, my dear. I couldn't stand seeing you two go through all that stress because of her. He then went to the kitchen to find out who was the next in command to appoint them as the acting manager, considering the drama that just happened. He returned to us and explained that he had some important work-related matters to attend to, as well as the task of formally dismissing Olive and handling the paperwork for the new acting manager. Okay, my work here is done for now. You two enjoy your meal. On the house! As we sat down at a table, I felt a mix of emotions. I was still processing everything that had happened, and I couldn't believe how quickly things had escalated. But I was also incredibly grateful to have my dad by our side, supporting us through it all. Hey there, I'm Cindy, age 36. My life was always a roller coaster ride, but this one ride was worth remembering. So I work as a teacher in a local primary school in Brookline, Massachusetts. I was a divorcee at the time and was taking a break from everything. My ex-husband was a cop. His life and my life were completely opposite. He had a life full of dangers while I have a weak heart. I prefer red solace over risky adventures. He was a grumpy person, serious, had anger issues, and sometimes a tad bit misogynistic. I remember him having opinions about my work life and how I was neglecting the household, how he should be the one bringing bread to the table and not me. When we divorced, he was very angry. He said that I was a weakling and that I couldn't stand criticisms and the truth. I found that really hard to believe that whatever he said could be deemed honest and correct. After that, my life went back to the usual pace. Went to school every day, taught kids, came home, made dinner. It was becoming a little monotonous. 
It is not that I didn't have friends, but I needed some constant companionship. I understand how problematic this can be, even sought therapy to keep it at bay. The lonely heart wouldn't shut up. So when I met Lenny at a local bookshop, my heart fluttered like that of a corny 17-year-old. He was a store owner. He was well fit and very handsome. His hair was a blend of wavy and straight with a little gray area at the sides. I was going in there every Saturday to buy some new books. I am an avid reader and having Lenny as my crush was a definite plus. He was a sweet guy. He would quietly sit at the corner reading his daily news and I would sit at one of the solo chairs and try out the books from the fictional section. It was like this every weekend and I would make it a habit to look for him every time I entered the shop. He also had a son. His name was Cain. He would come to take the place of his father every now and then. He was an energetic kid, made big gestures when people who knew him came to his shop. Cain was always a bit up and going, opposite to what Lenny was. There was a cafe right next to the bookshop. Usually after work, I would enjoy a nice cup of coffee with my favorite book in hand. I would sometimes see Lenny come and sit at the little table next to the window. There were times when we locked eyes and he would smile sweetly. The smile used to make my heart flutter. I would smile back. Hey, so are you from around here? Well, I live a few blocks away from here. I'm a primary teacher. And you are the bookshop owner? <laughs> you noticed, right? You are a regular customer in our little store. There are always plenty of people coming in, but you are very distinguishable from all of them. Ah, yes, I love books a lot, and this is the only bookstore that keeps the collection of books that I like, so I try to make some time to stop by. Yes, we are a bit old-schooled, and many people love to come here because they get some old collections that are not sold anymore. Oh, am I so rude? My name's Lenny. And I'm Cindy. He came from his table to mine and we started a jolly conversation. He is funny and a free-spirited person. He spoke about his childhood, politics, education. We were having a gala time when suddenly Cain, his son, came inside the cafe with a package. At first, he didn't notice me, but when he did, he seemed a bit annoyed. Here, Dad. Uncle sent you the thing that you wanted, the set of drivers. We can fix those rotten doors now. Uh, who's this? Let me introduce you to Cindy. She is our regular. We were just chatting up. Hmm, well, you do remember that we have a family dinner tonight, right? Of course, how could I forget that? It'll be around eight. Yes, and please be on time. I felt like it was natural for someone to feel protective about their parents. I wasn't blessed with children, which was more or less God's will. I feel like the divorce would have affected my children a lot, and a father like that wouldn't have been a good example. That night, I called my parents and spoke to them. They live in Florida, and sometimes in situations like these, I miss them. I remember excitedly telling them about how I found Lenny and how much of a good guy he is. My mother was always a supportive woman. She kept asking me if now it was the right time for me to find a trusty companion. I was being very hesitant about it. I knew if I became impulsive here, this would probably be a horrible decision. The next day, I remember going to the bookshop a bit earlier than usual. I couldn't help but notice how decked up I was. Maybe I did it unconsciously, maybe for Lenny. My heart skipped just thinking about it. How can I help you? Oh, I was just here to return some of the books I borrowed. Uh, is Lenny here? Father isn't here. Do you need anything else? Oh, I just wanted to drop by and say hi. So here are the books. Hmm, thank you. Are these all? Yes, that's all. Uh, if you ever see your father, can you please tell him that... No, I'm sorry, I cannot do that. My father is going through a rough patch and he doesn't need any of these. 
I don't know what your intentions are, but I would prefer if you didn't meddle into our family affairs. I just felt nice talking to him, that's all. I'm sorry. Please do visit again. I felt thoroughly embarrassed. I know I probably looked very desperate and I should stop. This is true. I am meddling in family matters and this would cause much trouble. It was late at night when I received a missed call on my phone. I don't pick up unknown numbers, but I felt something about this one. The call went on voicemail and instantly I recognized that voice. It was Lenny. But how did he have my number? I didn't share any of my details with him. Well, I didn't think much of it and I fell asleep. The next day, I got another call from the same number. I excused myself from the class and called back. Hi, hi, am I speaking to Cindy? Lenny, right, yes I am. How did you get my number? It's funny how we stop thinking about our age and do things as if we were still in high school or something. I got your number from the record list. When we first took your name, we asked for your number, remember? Oh, I see. Oh, I'm so sorry. I can keep the call if you want. I know this was very inappropriate. We take numbers so that we can remind the readers whenever a new stock has arrived, and we are very protective about the numbers. But I wanted to contact you. I'm happy that you called. I went to the shop the other day looking for you, and your son told me you weren't there. My son hasn't mentioned me anything, so it explains he doesn't want to. I understand. It is not a good thing for them to see their father move on with a stranger. They know nothing about me. They just enjoy seeing me sulk around in the shop and not meet anyone. They're just children. They wouldn't understand any of this. So, are you going through a rough patch, your wife? She was never a good mother. She left after I had my second child. She told me on my face that motherhood wasn't a fit for her and gaslighted me, saying that I manipulated her into all this. She left long back. I'm, I'm so sorry. Does she... The doorbell rang. Oh, dear, I have to go. I don't have much time left before the next class. Can I speak to you later? Hey, hey, before you go... I just want to tell if you will be able to make it for a small dinner at my place. My son won't mind. I'll talk to him. I will let you know, all right? I was invited for a small dinner and I was nervous. I didn't know what they would feel in my presence. But I felt like I was doing nothing wrong. He invited me. He wanted me to come, but his son would not approve of it, I know. But all I can do is try it. The dinner could have gone worse, to be honest, but somehow Lenny did his best to manage. We were talking and laughing about our childhood. He even cooked us some steak and mashed potatoes with some red wine to wash it all down. He was such a sweetheart. It made me feel bad for all the things he was going through. His wife, Michelle, and he were married young and they were these badass bikers swerving through the lanes and traveling through the country they were those delinquent sweethearts people read in books about they got married in some local church as they eloped later on michelle got pregnant and that's when things went downhill it was a difficult thing to accept being left behind by the person you sacrificed your family for i reached out to hold his hand when Cain stormed into the room looking furious. Dad, again, how many times have I told you not to bring random strangers at home? And what is this? It's her. Cain, dear, I was just talking to your father. We're just having dinner, please. You keep quiet. You're trying to mooch off my father behind my back. Enough, Cain. How dare you? You have crossed your line. Can you please not let your father have a bit of peace? And what are you on about multiple people? I had friends and their wives come over. When did I ever bring someone I like? Really? Like, do you want to end up like how you and mom did again? She will leave you too. Look at her. She's younger as well. I said enough. Now go to your room. 
I was just having a nice dinner and you are always coming out of your way to ruin things. You and your sister are enough of my responsibilities. Give me a break. I will never approve of this. She will never be our mother. After Cain stormed upstairs, we both sat there silently contemplating what just happened. I was shaking from inside when Lenny reached out and held my hand. He was looking sad and humiliated. I kept blaming myself inside my head. I knew what we did was not seen fairly by most of the children these days. I held his hand tightly and sat quietly. I didn't know what else to say. I'm sorry for what you had to witness. He can be stubborn sometimes, but he will come around. Don't worry. I don't want to convince them to trust. I want to earn it, and this won't be that simple. We are heartbroken people seeking companionship. That concept is lost in children these days. They think we always have bad intentions, but we just want peace. Um, so do you want to stay a bit longer or do you want me to drop you? I think right now it wouldn't be a good idea to stay. They're already really angry, so I think I should leave and no, you don't have to drop me. Well, at least let me escort you to the door. Okay, Lenny. After a few months of exchanging small conversations and spending time, we thought we could tie the knot. A very simple event, nothing too extravagant, just a few friends, my parents, and that's it. Sadly, Cain was not present. He and his fiancé were out on a trip before they tied the knot. I was trying to not feel too bad at these things. I know they're children and they're not able to empathize with us because they're swayed by strong emotions. Lenny was such a darling. He was really a different man than what I experienced with my ex. He was much calmer and politer. He was helping around, talking to guests and smiling radiantly. Angela was our event manager. She was one of my colleague's sisters. She made this humble arrangement in such a short period. You did a fantastic job. Thank you so much, dear. I'm more than happy to have helped. You are an adorable couple and seeing love blossoming in hard times gives me hope. I heard that you were also going to arrange Kane's event. He will get married in two months. Yes, Lenny spoke to me about everything and gave me the list of things that he needed me to do, like, you know, the number of guests, food, drinks, etc. I hope it is a success for you, Angela. Hoping to stay in touch. Me too, Cindy. The event went rather smoothly. At the end of the day, Lenny and I managed to sit quietly and take a shot of wine together. We seemed content but still troubled. Lenny told me the other day that Michelle had gotten news of his marriage and had planned to pay a short visit. I knew that this day would be coming, so I didn't stop him. I wanted things to come to terms. And I wanted to meet whoever this Michelle was. Kane said he wouldn't be back too soon. They went to Brazil and they were having much more fun. Lenny was really sad. He wanted his son to understand the situation. He was always sighing and sometimes even sitting alone on the porch, staring into space. I did not like bothering him much. I knew he needed some time off. On the other hand, Kane and his fiance came back from their little trip. They bought souvenirs for everyone except me. I was not surprised, and it's all right. I wanted Lenny and Kane to at least talk about this, like a father-son time. With time, things changed. They spent hours arguing over things that were stupid and trivial, and sometimes Kane would storm out of the house in the middle of the night. Sometimes he'd even come back two days later. After a month and a half, our doorbell rang. I was at home that day. I took a day off. I reached out for the door and felt a tingling sensation down my spine. I knew why. I opened the door and looked straight into Michelle's eyes. My heart completely stopped. There she was, standing with her worn-out jacket and ripped jeans. I have seen her pictures, so I knew what she would look like. I wasn't able to move a muscle until she spoke first. Oh, so you are his new lady. Bad choice. 
She stormed inside the room like it was hers and sat on the sofa lavishly. She put her legs up on her table, crossed and looked at me while chewing gum. I was slightly annoyed by this gesture, but I took a deep breath and relaxed my nerves. Do you want some tea, coffee, wine? Wine. Fetch it in a tall glass. Sure. My hands were trembling. I didn't know how things would be when Lenny came back. He would be in shock. I mean, this was so unexpected. I glanced back to see she was surfing through the magazines that were lying on the table scattered. So, what is it about you that he likes so much? It's not like you are that pretty. I don't know. You can ask him. We just seek companionship. I just want him to be happy. So, are you trying to tell me that I didn't keep him happy? I'm not suggesting anything. I'm stating that's all. I don't know what went wrong, but Michelle abruptly stood up and threw the wine glass aiming at the bookshelf right behind me. I was stone cold. She was laughing hysterically and looked like a freaking maniac. What on earth? This woman was Lenny's wife. I can't even believe it. She looked like a total psycho. Whoops. Was that expensive? Sorry. <laughs> Look, bimbo. Whether you both are married or not, I don't care. He's still mine and will always be mine. You are just a replacement. My children have not even accepted you yet. You can never be their mother. I have their birthright. Before I could say anything, she left the house with a loud bang. Wow, quite a character. Lenny was too soft for her. He deserved better. I promised myself I would protect Lenny at all costs. When Lenny came back home, I was too stunned to speak. I thought it wouldn't be the right time. At dinner, we all sat down together. Kane began to grumble. My mom doesn't want Cindy to be at my wedding, Dad. And please, I don't want any trouble during my wedding. I want no nonsense. Cindy, you are not coming. Are we clear? Yes, dear, I understand. What, yes? Why are you agreeing to this nonsense? She was their mother, but she doesn't deserve that right. Kane, quickly eat your damn food. We are not having this discussion. I had to hold Lenny's hand. I had something in my mind. Lenny eyed me and he probably caught something, so he carried on with his food silently. At least Cindy understands better than you, lol. Keep her away, do you get me? She is not my biological mother. We both ate quietly that night. That night, I made a call to Angela. I told her that I would love to meet her tomorrow. She gave me a time around the afternoon. I wanted harmless revenge for all the scenes Michelle did to me the other day. And maybe to Kane as well for being so stubborn. So how can I help you? Can you please do me a favor? I know it's stupid, but I want it. Yes. So, are the invitations already sent and the date fixed? All is done. Just the catering is left. I have to call them again. I kind of want you to change the date of the wedding. Like, all the guests, Kane, his fiancée, and his biological mother, should be unaware of this. I want them to think that the wedding is taking place on the right date but it actually won't happen. Postpone it to one week. <laughs> I see. You must have your reasons. I respect that. And it is very much possible. A guestless wedding sounds interesting. The deed was done. The date was shifted and fresh invitations were sent to all the guests with a new date and an apology note. Lenny, on the other hand, did a fantastic job addressing all these guests individually, explaining the situation and convincing them to play along with it. This was a tedious task, but so worth it. We all knew how important the wedding was to Kane and his mom. I didn't want her to have the satisfaction, 
The fit he threw on the day was worth recording. He was so shocked and dumbfounded to see how nobody came. The fact he called his friends and none of them picked up, he must have been so confused. He paced around, agitated. His fiance was lost, like him, and his mother <laughs> threw a fit as well. Once they left the venue, she went directly to our home. Lenny was at home watching TV as nothing happened. Lenny was at home watching TV as if nothing happened. You never deserve to be the mother. You are a pathetic woman. I should be calling the cops on you for whatever you attempted on my wife. So I don't want you prying on my family any more. Do you get me, woman? You are the problem. You are a manipulative person. I hate you. Why the hell do you love her, huh? I don't know for how long the quarrel would have continued, but at least Lenny was able to give a piece of his mind and was able to let out years of frustration. Now we are slowly trying to get adjusted to the new things. The wedding was postponed, but at least Kane calmed down his angry boy demeanor. He was finally learning the course of events and how being hot-headed doesn't help. Michelle. Left with a heavy heart, she won't be welcome here ever again. And I am finally happy with the man I love, and I just hope it stays like this forever. Hi, I'm Gabby. Just turned thirty-one this May. This birthday was important to me because I needed a break from all the crap I've been living through. I still live with my mom in Michigan. I mean, we were the four of us before things went downhill. After getting married, I moved into my place. We had a nice room upstairs while mom and dad took the room below. Things were okay in a way. I met Tim at a friend's birthday party. He was this cool, funny guy who loves to make lame jokes and laugh at it. I mean, he was like the light of the room. I, on the other, was the shy girl who would never make proper advances. My friend Joyce worked at the same place as me. We work at an established clothing shop as saleswomen, and that's where I noticed how we were like two opposite energies that were balanced. Joyce was kind of like Tim, hyper energetic, loves meeting new people, and all that. When she called me to this party, I was kind of unsure if I could. Blend with the rest of them, but it had been a long time since I went out to a party. When I reached there, people were already acquainted with each other, and the air felt drunk. I didn't like drinking much because I feel like I always lose control. I was a 27-year-old adult, confused, trying to blend in, being so lame and boring. Not knowing anyone, I sat on the lonely sofa that was at the corner of the room. Joyce spotted me from around the corner and squealed as she approached me. "Hey, girl, what's up? You are late." "Oh, so sorry. I didn't know what to wear, and I made a mess out of my room, so had to fix things up." "Fine, fine. Well, this has been your first ever party, and you are not leaving this place without experiencing what it's like to get drunk." No, no, I would get lost in myself. You know, I'm not very tolerant of these things. Ah, come on. We'll go bike riding by the water if you feel too overwhelmed. You know, I'm throwing this party because of you. I want you to get along. You have lived here with your parents your whole life, and I've seen how submissively you deal with rude customers. You need a definite upgrade. I will give you formal training on how to boss up. What party for me? You must be crazy. Do you look at me? I am dying inside. How can I possibly get an upgrade? Bra gabs, you are naive. I never had a proper friend. Friend, I always make acquaintances, new faces every day. But that sometimes gets lonely. When you first joined the job, I thought you were nerdy, and it kind of made me smile. Not gonna lie. I think the day when I saw you deal with those rude ass people, I realized that this girl needs definite help. And yeah, maybe I'm not the most trusty sword, but you can still wield me when you're in danger. Ha <laughs> ha! Thanks. 
This was considerate of you. I think I will be able to manage, but, but it's getting really hot here. I'll go out and get some fresh air. Absolutely, but not before you get a couple of drinks, hee <laughs> hee. The night was buzzing for me and I never thought I would be making social interactions with people. But I guess when you're under the influence of alcohol, your personality is deemed to change. I stumbled across the room through people trying to seek the exit. It was beautiful, breezy summer weather. I took a ditzy stroll around the house. The backyard seemed empty and there was a swing. I thought the booze was getting up in my head and getting me a bit nauseous, so I went and dropped myself on the swing. I was staring at space, thinking about my parents. My mom was a shy introvert, unlike my dad. I think I got this personality type from her. She's very soft-spoken, keeps to herself, and loves the company of solemnity. My dad was loud and talking, always preferring company other than my mom. He loves going out for solo trips, sometimes coming back two to three weeks later. He would bring small souvenirs, but that never made sense to my mom. My mom preferred small accessories like hair clips and bracelets. My father got her stationaries. I was like, why? He was very casual about everything and felt like not everything in life should have an emotional value. Sometimes I wonder how they got together with such contrasting personalities. I felt drowsy and I could feel my eyes getting heavy, drifting into unconsciousness, when a sudden sprinkle of water on my face got me up. I jolted upright, turning to face a guy who was twice as drunk as I am. He was tall, well-built, and had dark brown hair. I was a bit wary of him, so I moved away. He was smiling and giggling, but didn't make any wrong moves. Rather, he sat on the wooden stool, tilting his head to one side as he gazed at me. You are... I'm a duck. (laughs) Oh, right, sure. I felt like he was going to fool around because he's under the influence of God knows how many shots. I turned away to go when he suddenly uttered my name. What? Wait, how do you know me? You are Joyce's new protege, huh? Kind of cute. X, excuse me? I don't exactly know you. Of course you don't know me. I'm Timmy, but you can call me Tim. Shorter and simple. (laughs) Great meeting you. Well, you already know me, so I don't need the point why I should say anything further. But I can assure you I am not Joyce's protege. I'm her friend. Tim closed his eyes and giggled. I was feeling quite uncomfortable in his presence. I wanted to leave. The only thing I needed right then was the comfort of my bed. It was getting late and I was extremely tired after all the interactions I had. I scurried inside the house and looked for Joyce. She was there lounging on the sofa talking to some guy. I went up to her and whispered in her ears. She nodded to the guy and excused herself. You met Tim? Oh, that skimpy brat. Is he a nice person? Well, he is very misunderstood amongst people, but I can assure you he doesn't have antisocial behavior. (laughs) Well, okay, I'd better go. I need sleep, and we have work tomorrow, remember? Yeah, yeah, I'll be on time if that's what you're worried about. Do you want me to book a cab or ride my bicycle? No, you're too drunk for this, and I was planning to walk, so it's all right. I'll take the shorter route. After bidding our farewell, I tipsily made my way to the right-hand side of the street and went along the narrow pavement. It was around 8.30 p.m. and the streets were getting quieter. I mean, it would have been a waste of money if I took a cab, especially when my place was just a few blocks away. But I was wearing a short dress and the streets were getting quieter. I couldn't help but get a tad bit nervous. My hands were getting cold My breathing became sharp. I fastened my pace a bit. Suddenly, I could feel a grip on my arm, and out of fright, I screamed and flung the bag right in the direction of the alarming presence. A loud thud and a man's pained voice echoed through the silent air. I turned around to see. It was Tim. Damn, woman, you can pack a punch. The nifty handbag you have got right there. What do you carry? Why? Why are you following me? What's with you? 
I wanted to escort you, that's all. It was late, and when I saw you go out, I was kind of worried, so I had to follow you. I didn't know how to call you from the back, so I, um... Well, you could have just called me from the back instead of coming and grabbing me. Well, clouded judgments. I'm so sorry. I should not have scared you like that. At least it would have spared me the nice hit. I'm so sorry. I hope you're okay. I am. <laughs> I'm quite a strong man, but not going to lie, that blow was something else. He smiled like a kid as he drooped his head tiredly, scruffing his messy hair. He looked like he was going to collapse and he was reeking of alcohol. I let him follow me quietly behind me. I kept glancing back to see what he was up to. He had his hands in his pockets glancing back at me. I felt so flustered. I had a few friends back when I was in Ohio, but once I shifted to Michigan, things changed. I quietened down a bit more. It's been a long time since I spoke to a guy. He didn't seem too threatening. He was rather really sweet. Fast forward to when we started dating. It just happened weirdly, but... I noticed that I saw a lot of my father's personality in him. He was casual, not too serious about things. He was like a burst of energy. Took me to parties and small cafes, even rock concerts. My introverted mind was going all crazy with these interactions, but I enjoyed that side of him. I mean, he helped me balance. He would come to visit my parents and sometimes take me to his place. We were growing intimate and I weirdly felt good around him. I mean, he was not an ideal guy, like his house is a mess, smells a lot, he eats nothing but store-bought food, but he was also kind, cheery, and sometimes a little childlike. He took care of me and my parents. My mom was not fond of him much, but my dad was. Maybe he could see a lot of himself in him. He would come often for dinner, stay the night, and enjoy drinks with my dad. Joyce was highly surprised by all of this. We met in a cafe for a small chit-chat when she brought him up. Girl, you need to explain how it all happened. Tim, really? That guy won the lottery. Well, it is a long story. If I start saying anything now, it would probably take like a few more coffees and more snacks. <laughs> in short, he is a sweet guy. Who could have thought? A shy girl with a hipster man? just like those tropes from the novels. But as long as you're happy, I'm happy. Plus, we get to go on group dates. You, you're seeing someone? I mean, kinda. I'm trying not to rush it too much. Taking things nice and slow is the key to avoiding misunderstandings. We chatted for hours and hours. I felt like things were going to be all right and maybe I will be able to manage having a decent life. After a few months... Tim Jericho, Joyce's partner, Joyce and I went for a small trip to Hawaii. It was Jericho's funding. His father was in the tourism company for many years and this trip was a blessing to all of us. There, Tim played a stunt by pulling out the marriage thingy on me. It was a pleasant shock. I never thought he would go all the way with the planning. You sure? Do you want this? I mean, isn't it going fast? I feel like sweet things shouldn't wait too long. Shouldn't we think this through? If we take so much time, someone might swoon you away from me. <laughs> I did take my time to respond. I wanted to be sure that this was it and I'm about to take life's biggest decision ever. But I remember my mom being extremely silent about all this. She just did her part of the duties, but she never really approved or disapproved anything. As I stood there, my heart racing with anticipation, I couldn't help but feel a surge of joy and gratitude. Today was the day I would marry the love of my life, Tim. The sun was shining brightly, casting a golden glow over the picturesque venue that we had chosen for our special day. As I walked down the aisle, my eyes met Tim's and the world around us seemed to fade away. The soft strains of our chosen melody filled the air, creating a soundtrack to our love story. The reception was a joyful affair filled with laughter, heartfelt toasts and dances that would be etched in our memories forever.
The room was adorned with flowers, twinkling lights, and little touches that reflected our personalities. It was a true reflection of our love and the journey that brought us to this very moment. Oh, how horribly cringe I'm feeling describing that event, but my naive self would have truly written that as a romance writer. Finally, a useful wit for my daughter. <laughs> this brave young man did the best of all things, i.e. being my son-in-law. <laughs> Cheers. Now, Tim, my boy, I can finally gala around with a man. Please do keep my daughter safe. She is very important to me. Oh, I will, mother dearest. You need not worry so much. Throughout the evening, I couldn't help but steal glances at Tim, my life partner. We laughed, we danced, and we savored every moment together. It was a celebration of our love and the beautiful future that awaited us. Oh, how I wish this was the truth. Poor Gabby, you were profoundly stupid. As I reflect on the early days of our marriage, there's a memory that still brings a mix of frustration and fury to my heart. It was a time when Tim and his father-in-law, my dad, seemed to have fallen into a pattern of relying on others for support. That was me and my mom. My mom is working as a librarian in a local school, and I was, am, still working in the clothing shop. My father was a cab driver and Tim joined the construction site. Both of them got low pay and sometimes they both would hang out in the bars and drink all night. Come home really late in the morning. Tim's boss already raised a lot of complaints against him. They say he keeps lagging in his work and sometimes even smokes weed at the corner. He was given warnings but he couldn't care less. Babe, we need to talk. You're getting written and verbal complaints from your workplace. Are you not enjoying the job? Like, I thought you care about us. I am. But sometimes I get lazy. It's a boring job. Plus, I'm not having time for myself. I want to enjoy life a bit more. That's not how things work, Tim. We are married. We can always find time for ourselves, but we must think of our future. I am thinking about our future, love. I just feel like these kinds of jobs are not cut for me. I'm more like a business person. Of course, you can start a business. I'm not stopping you. Have you thought about any sort of investment plans? What is the business and how will you go on with it? It's not easy to run a business, you know. I and Patrick have thought about it together, but before I can say anything about that, I forgot to tell you something. I was planning to go on a short trip with my boys. Um, trip? Didn't you go on a trip a month before, babe? Where are you getting the income to spend on these trips? Oh, no, it's not mine. A friend of mine arranged it. I'm just hoping. I will come back and think of everything seriously. All right, so just relax. You are tense all the time. This isn't right getting dependent on other people for such things. How will you pay the favor back? And this is the third time you went on another person's funded trip. Yeah, yeah, I get it. I'll do whatever I can. I've asked for a little money from your mom. She was sweet to provide. I will repay it. How, how could you? Why would you do that? I was here. You could have asked me. My mom is working hard. Please don't take anything from her. I think she has dealt with that enough with my dad. Having a husband like that is a definite nightmare. Tim never showed this part of his character before. I mean, he always had very casual, loud and flaunty behavior. I knew deep down I got myself in trouble just like how my mom got when she fell in love with dad. As I reflect on the dynamics within the family, there's a persistent frustration that lingers within me. It's a feeling that arises whenever I witness my own father's consistent freeloading behavior, taking advantage of my mom and me. Growing up, my father had always been unreliable when it came to financial responsibilities. He would often neglect his duties, leaving my mom to shoulder the burden of providing for our family. 
I watched as she worked tirelessly, juggling multiple jobs to make ends meet, while my father seemed content to float through life without any sense of responsibility. I kind of figured out how he would be as a person, but I saw you being so happy, and you know how I am not good at expressing myself. Tim has won the heart of your dad, and he has a general way with words which can get hard to resist. Mom, sorry. You're going through a lot, and I added up to it more. No, sweetie. It's all right. We can work things out. I just wish your father could start acting like one, because he and Tim are bonding over the wrong interests. I will pay you back all the money Tim owes because I have a feeling he doesn't save up enough to do so. Days pass by and Tim has left for his trip. My dad, on the other hand, told me that he was going to my uncle's place for a few days. He said he would be back. He just needs to borrow some money. I was working overtime because Joyce went on a trip to Spain. She deserved it, so I had to take her part in the work as well. I didn't mind. I wanted to feel distracted, so this was good for me. After work, while I was returning home, my phone buzzed multiple times. I opened it to see that it was Joyce. She sent some pictures. I was in complete and utter shock when I saw Tim in those pictures in Spain. Another girl in his arms and his friends were there too. Joyce left. I told you so. Beneath the photo, I was beyond furious. I was humiliated. I have married a nuisance, a good for nothing. He said he would think about this seriously, and I believe that. I went home and punched so hard on the cardboard that it left a small dent. That miserable guy, horrible character, is my husband, and he cheats on me too. He cheats on me. I'll call him. He is answerable to me. Two days later, when I was recovering from the shock, some men came to our doorstep. They looked like gangsters. I don't know. They just looked intimidating, but they weren't here to harm us. I was too scared to interact at first, but I knew I had a mother to protect. I opened the door, and they started asking for money from me. I was stoked by their response. They were hell bent on the fact that they were scammed by Tim. When Tim was on the trips with his friends, he sold off some weed to the locals, claiming it was good stuff and it costs a lot. Later on, they found out it was the cheapest weed. When they confronted Tim about that, he said it was my idea and that the money would be with me. Tim still owed money worth ten thousand dollars to them. What has he been doing behind my back? I was not taking that. I told them Tim would be paying for all of it. And that they can keep all the other belongings owned by Tim. His house crashed, and later found out that he was running a small drug dealer business. I filed a report to the police claiming that Tim was a problematic person, and he had been doing shady businesses, dealing with the underworld people, and all. I was like a decoy to him. He thought he would get married and move in with me, and he would not be suspected. I called his number that day. I used a different cell number because I knew he wouldn't be picking up otherwise. The voice that picked on the other side was not Tim. It was my father, Patrick. Hello, hello. Who is this? Who is this? I'm Gabby's friend. She was telling me she couldn't reach Tim on the line, so I just gave a call on her behalf to see if everything is okay. Oh, everything's fine, dear. Don't worry about it. I'll tell him to call Gabby back. I could hear Tim's voice from the back telling my dad to cut the call and join him. I recorded everything. I have his pictures and recordings now, enough to get him sued. What better reason can I have for a divorce? It took me so long to find out what Tim was actually up to. He never really loved me. It was easy to manipulate me because I'm dumb. I told you everything, Mom. She was heartbroken, but not too shocked. She told me it was time she and I left the house and settled elsewhere. She had an old flat for rental somewhere in the west of Michigan. 
She said she can't afford to buy it now, but at least we can be relieved from this mess. The police reported as saying that he would be imprisoned once he comes back. And boy, what a pleasant surprise they probably had when they returned to an empty house with two unpaid bills and two divorce papers on the table. <laughs> Hello everyone, my name's Sandra and I'm 28. I live in Houston, Texas, but I'm planning to move out soon. I was in a terrible marriage for a year and a half, but I managed to come out of it thanks to my father and the police. It was all my fault. I got myself into this. If I was a bit clever, maybe I would have done the right thing and said no to that marriage. I was always this very shy and aloof girl didn't quite like hanging out with people. I always stayed in front of my computer and having unlimited internet availability, I was completely engrossed in the virtual world. There were very few times I would go to pubs and enjoy a drink, but then there would be weird strangers who would approach me and try to make friends with me. But I strongly refused their offer as they were complete strangers and they could kidnap me for heaven's sake. My mother died when I was six. She had an untreated heart condition. I was raised by my father. He worked as a Marine since the age of 23. He would often leave us for long journeys through adventurous waters and explore new things. I missed him a lot during those times. He would send letters to my mother and even try to call her whenever there was an opportunity. When my mom died, he came back. He saw me crying like crazy beside the casket. He picked me up and tried his very best to console me. Hey, my little girl, miss me? Wow, you have grown so much. <laughs> Papa, ah, uh, I... Hey now, Dove, it's all right. Now that Daddy's here, you'll be all right, I promise, okay? I still kept crying in his arms, clutching his uniform. My dad slowly patted my back and kept humming my favorite lullaby until I finally fell asleep. That night, I saw him sitting alone on the couch, drinking. He looked pale and sad. He kept muttering something to himself and then muffled his face on the cushion and started crying. That was the second time I saw him cry. The first was when I fell from the slide and hurt myself. Maybe he blamed himself for all the things that happened. He took a break for two months before leaving for work again. Before doing so, he left me with my grandmother, who took care of me while he was away. Be nice to Granny, okay? She's here for you. You will be a good girl and help her out. And, and you? I'll come back soon, my dove. I told Granny to teach you to bake your favorite sweets and your favorite dishes. You will learn from her well, won't you? Yes, Dad, I will. Next time I come back, I would love to try out your dishes. <laughs> now I must go. My car's waiting. You take care of yourself, honey. He left. I knew he would be returning after six months or so. He would often send me gifts and small souvenirs from the places he had visited. I would mostly stay indoors and help Grandma out with her chores. I avoided playing with kids. I didn't like to. As I grew up, I became more and more dependent on the comfort of my room. My dad eventually sent me back to our old home. I hated going to college. I hated interacting with people. The internet gave me more confidence than the outside world could ever do, each with its own stories waiting to be discovered. It's both thrilling and comforting to talk to people whom I'll probably never meet in person. I can share my thoughts, feelings, and interests with them, knowing that they won't judge me for being an introvert. In this vast sea of connections, I've found friends who truly understand me. Through the screen, I've met people from different cultures, backgrounds, and experiences. It's fascinating to learn about their lives and to realize how similar we all are, despite our differences. The internet has become a bridge that spans across continents, bringing us together in ways that were once unimaginable. There, I met a guy named Ricky. He was a streamer, at least that's what he told me. He first started with chat and then it went ahead with video calls. 
I often hid my identity by wearing a Batman mask and he would put a scarf around his face and wear a beanie. Hi, Sandra. It's great to see you finally. Hello, Rick. Nice to meet you um, virtually. <laughs> Likewise. So how are you doing today? How many people did you chat with in total? Oh, I'm doing fine. Just a bit nervous, to be honest. You? That's completely normal, but trust me, I don't bite. I'm as awkward as you are. After all, it's our first proper conversation. So, Rick, tell me more about you. How did you end up on this online platform? Well, I love meeting new people and exploring different perspectives. I tend to stay at home more often than I should, and this online community seemed like a perfect opportunity to do just that. How about you? Well, I'm a typical introvert, so I find it a bit challenging to socialize in traditional settings. Online platforms provide a sense of comfort and allow me to open up a bit more. I completely understand. Virtual connections can be surprisingly meaningful. I'm glad we crossed paths. We chatted for a while, finding common interests and sharing stories about their lives. I began to feel more at ease as the conversation flowed naturally. You know, I never expected to feel this comfortable talking to someone online. Thank you for making it easy. It really helps. The feeling's mutual, Sandra. You're a great conversationalist and I'm glad we connected. If you ever want to chat again, just let me know. I'm mostly online playing Mario. <laughs> oh, forgot to ask. Do you game? I'd love that, Rick. By the way, no, I mostly blog and scroll through Reddit. There are some awesome kinds of stuff you can find there. I feel like I get to learn from other people's stories than from real life examples. Haha, <laughs> true. I feel like our own lives can be such a bummer sometimes. It's fascinating to get to know others. Like, look at me. I trust my online friends more than the ones who exist in my life. The best thing about virtual stuff is that you don't have to feel obliged to keep in contact. You can take it or leave it. Your choice. As the conversation continued, Ricky and I built a genuine connection despite being virtual strangers. Our shared understanding and open-mindedness create a sense of friendship that transcends the screen. I'm not sure where this journey will lead me, but one thing is certain. My online experiences have shaped who I am. As I continue to navigate through life, I know that the lessons I've learned from my digital haven will always be a part of me. My father, on the other hand, is a very careful person. If he finds out I'm making friends who I haven't even seen, he would get super pissed. The last time he came to me, he sat me down and ended up lecturing me during dinner. How are your studies, Dove? Dad, I've graduated. Well, you wouldn't know. You didn't come. Oh, Sandra. Ugh, bad, you know. I was extremely busy. And I was sorry then and sorry now. I even emailed you saying I would be there for your birthday. Tomorrow is my pumpkin's birthday. Ah, uh, stop calling me names. I'm no longer six, you know. Well, to me, you will always be my little dove. Anyways, what have you planned for the future? Are you thinking of working? I don't know. What do you mean, I don't know? What are your friends doing currently? I do not have any friends. What? Look, dear, I haven't shifted you to your mom's house so that you can stay home and not socialize with the world. There are so many things you're missing out on. So many people you won't be able to meet if you don't step out, honey. That's the problem, Dad. I don't know how to. But I'll try. I mean, I do make friends, but they are online. Online? Sandra, that's the worst platform to make friends. Oh, Jesus. Okay, well, fine. How about we go out today? A little bit of shopping, just you and me. I haven't been out at all recently. I don't know if I can or... Absolutely you can, Sandra. You have to try it. This is not a healthy way of living. I understand ever since Marissa died, you have become... Why are you bringing mom into this? What are you trying to suggest? I am not suggesting anything, honey. I'm just saying that there are ways to move on from grievances. 
as much as we both love your mom, we must learn to move on. I don't know why, but I got very angry. I slammed the table and stood up. I didn't even want to finish my food. I took my plates towards the sink. Sandra, do not give your father that attitude, please. I was trying to help you. Why don't you understand? You don't know anything about me, so don't even try to. I was so angry. I went online to find Rick. In the beginning, Ricky seemed like a nice person, understanding and willing to listen. I appreciated having someone to talk to, especially about the frustration that had been building up within me. Being an introvert, I always found comfort and solace in the familiarity of my home and the company of my computer screen. While others ventured out into the world, I preferred the safety of my virtual haven where I could be myself without the pressure of face-to-face -face interactions. My father had been pushing me more often lately ever since I told him that I spend most of my life online. I knew this would happen. He wouldn't understand. He believed that staying confined within the walls of my room would hinder my growth and personal development. He wanted me to experience life outside my comfort zone, and that thought terrified me. I would vent my frustrations to Ricky, hoping he would understand my predicament. Hey, hey, Sandra, do you want to meet up? I mean, we both are introverts, so we can meet up someplace that is quiet with not many people. I know a place like that. I don't know. I feel like it's really sudden. I need time to think. I just wanted to tell you whatever was going on. All right, no worries. I can wait. Whenever you feel like it, you can always drop by. Here, take my address. You're always welcome. Why are you being so nice to me? I'm a stranger, am I not? Because I like you. Like me? Are you serious? Yes. I know it sounds strange from my mouth, but I want to get to know you. And if you ever feel the same, you know where to meet me. It was a big deal for me stepping outside the world. My heart pounded with both excitement and nerves as I stood outside Rick's home, finally ready to meet the person I had been talking to online for the past month. He surprisingly lived very close to me, like a 20-minute drive or so. I took a deep breath, gathering my courage before knocking on the weathered wooden door. It creaked open, revealing... Rick with a warm smile that instantly eased my apprehension. He was quite a charming young man. His home might not have been what one would call complimenting at first glance, but there was something endearing about it. It exuded a sense of authenticity and the lived-in charm that made it feel welcoming. As I stepped inside, I couldn't help but notice the small details that revealed a lot about Ricky's character. The bookshelves filled with well-loved classics, the stack of board games, his computer setup, etc. Welcome, welcome to my humble abode. Your gracious presence was much needed, my fair master. <laughs> Some game language I probably won't understand, but thank you. This is quite a cozy place. Do you live alone? Nope, my fair princess. I live with my mom. She lives downstairs. I have the top floor all to myself. Come, I'll show you around. We spent the day talking, laughing, and discovering even more about each other. Meeting in person added depth to our connection, and I felt a newfound appreciation for the person behind the screen. Rick was just as kind and genuine as I had imagined, and his quirky sense of humor only made me like him more. As the sun dipped below the horizon, Rick suggested we take a stroll outside, and I agreed without hesitation. As we wandered along the nearby park, the conversation flowed effortlessly and my initial nervousness transformed into a feeling of comfort and ease. Being with him in person felt like an extension of our online chats, but with an added layer of intimacy that only face-to-face -face interactions could bring. Wait, are you telling me you didn't celebrate your birthday? Yeah, I didn't feel like it. Plus, my dad was really mean. I didn't know how to face him after the argument we had. Oh, I'm so sorry that it happened. I'm sure he'll come around. He's your father after all. I made a mistake. I trusted him too much. 
I felt like his words were honey, but I didn't realize that I was just like one of his games. When we started to date, he became an overly possessive and jealous boyfriend. He would always make me talk to him on the phone or online. If I ever tried to chat with anyone else, he would get angry. He kept saying that he loved me a lot and wanted to protect me. I believed him. Why did I believe him? As our relationship grew stronger, it became apparent that his mother didn't approve of me. It was disheartening to know that she harbored such negative feelings towards me, someone she hadn't even met in person. Her disapproval weighed on me, and I couldn't help but wonder why she couldn't see the love and care we had for each other. Rick's close relationship with his mother was evident, and he often referred to himself as a mama's boy. While I respected the bond they shared, it also created a sense of distance between us. I understood that family was essential to him, but I couldn't help feeling like an outsider trying to navigate the complexities of his mother's disapproval. The strangest thing ever, though, was that his mother low-key wanted us to marry off. She knew I had no one in the world and my father doesn't stay with me. She probably thought I would be a great servant to her needs. Not every parent is perfect. Look at your dad, for instance. At least my mother cares about me. Please, Rick. You know when you talk like that, it really hurts. Then? You know I'm the only one for you right now. Your dad doesn't love you. I do. So stop complaining so much about my life and try to compromise. We had a secret marriage. Ricky didn't allow me to invite my father, saying that he would never approve of this wedding. He successfully brainwashed me into thinking that my dad doesn't love me. I silently got married to him. I knew I have landed myself in dangerous waters. But I was a weak character. Call me a lame woman, but my personality was molded by my surroundings and I blame myself for not trying. After a few months of marriage, I began to see a side of his mother that I had never expected. One that was filled with cruelty and malice. She seemed to take pleasure in torturing me emotionally, making me question my worth and leaving me feeling broken and defeated. It started with subtle comments and passive-aggressive remarks, chipping away at my self-esteem bit by bit. I tried to brush it off, believing that her disapproval would fade with time, but instead it intensified, turning into a full-blown campaign of emotional torment. What is this? Do you call this food? You expect my boy to eat this atrocity? Go make it again, stupid girl. Or, why is there so much dirt here? Are you blind? What a shabby girl. Or, get up, lazy girl. Take the trash out. Now, Jesus, have your parents taught you nothing? Her words cut like a knife, leaving scars that ran deep within my soul. She would question my every decision, belittle my achievements, and manipulate situations to make me feel unworthy of Ricky's love. And my amazing husband would be in his room either listening to a song or playing video games. It felt like I was trapped in a never-ending nightmare, and no matter how hard I tried, I couldn't escape her grasp. I was pent up with internal rage inside me. My own stupidity and weakness added up to that rage. How could I be so weak? I miss my dad. I was regretting fighting with him. I shouted at him and told him to leave me alone. With a heavy heart, he left a few days after my birthday. Now I was stuck here. I deserved every bit of it. One day, I was not feeling really well. I felt very feverish, so I tucked myself on the sofa. I thought maybe a nap would do me some good. I was almost asleep when suddenly a cold gush of water was violently splashed at me. I woke up extremely startled and panicky. It was Ali. She had a disgusted look on her face. What the hell are you doing sleeping on our couch? Did you go get our groceries as ordered? I stayed silent. Oh, I see. You want your old mother-in-law to do all the dirty work while you laze around, you devil. 
She slapped my face and started calling out Ricky's name. I, I couldn't take it anymore. I lashed out. I am not doing anything for you or your useless son. I've had enough of your bullshit. Go find someone else to bother. I can't and I won't. I didn't get a single respect from this family and I don't care anymore. I was about to leave when something blunt fell on the back of my head. I blacked out. When I woke up, I saw myself in a semi-dark room. There was a small bowl lit at the center of the room. My head was hurting. I tried to get up on my feet, but I wobbled and fell down again. It was hurting everywhere. Where was I? I could hear muffled sounds from somewhere. It grew louder as it approached me. I tried to crawl toward the sound and found a metal door with a small window. I took its support to get up on my feet. It latched open and I saw Ricky grinning at me. Oh, is my wife scared of the dark? What is this, Ricky? Please get me out of here. This is not funny. Shut up. This is exactly what you get for raising your voice at my mother. Now, I will make sure you never see the day ever again. Pl please, Ricky. I'm sorry. I'll do anything. I promise I won't complain. Please let me out. I beg you. Not so soon, Buttercup. If you behave, I might think of releasing you. For now, this would be your little cave. It's not like you like going out anyways. And besides, who do you have? Your mom is dead. Your dad doesn't love you. You're nothing but a forgotten soul. My house gave you a chance to start over, but you wasted it. I'll make up for it. I really didn't mean to, Ricky. Please let me out. I don't like being in the dark. Oh, Daddy's little girl, aren't you? How about you scream his name? He would magically appear somehow and rescue his little princess. <laughs> he shut the window and went away. As I sat in the cold, dark basement, fear and anger coursed through my veins. How did things escalate to this point? All I had done was refuse to follow my mother-in-law's unreasonable orders, and now... I was paying the price for standing up for myself. As I reached my pockets, I felt my phone. It was broken and shattered. I lost all hope. But wait, there was a faint blinking of the screen. I could still call my dad. The screen was really faded, but I knew my dad's number by heart. With trembling hands, tears streaming down my face, I dialed his number. My voice shook as I told him what had happened, hoping against hope that he could somehow save me from this nightmare. Two days later, when I was half dead and despair threatened to consume me entirely, I heard a car pull up outside the house. My heart pounded in my chest as I strained to hear the sound of the footsteps coming down the stairs. When the door swung open, revealing my father standing tall and unwavering, a mix of relief and disbelief washed over me. I couldn't believe he had dropped everything and rushed to my aid. He brought a few cops along with him. Rick and Allie were immediately arrested. They were trying their best to lie, but were in vain. You have no idea what you both have waiting at court, you psychopaths. What have you done to my little girl? Sir, we are truly sorry. We meant no harm. I was thinking of releasing her today, I swear. And who are you to decide the punishment for my daughter? You look like something out of a sewer, pathetic little scumbag. Okay, come on, Sandra, let's go. As my dad escorted me out of that dark basement, I felt a newfound sense of courage and determination. The ordeal was far from easy but it had shown me that I could face challenges head-on with the unwavering support of my marine dad by my side. From that day forward, I vowed to stand up for myself and never let anyone take away my voice. I just hope Ricky and his mom rot in jail. I'm planning to move to New Orleans with my dad. Texas was not safe for me anymore. And yeah, I will make sure not to ever rely on online strangers anymore. Lesson learned. 
Hey y'all, I'm Steve, 36. So a few years ago, I got hitched to Tina. And you know what they say, when you marry someone, you're also stuck with their mom. In my case, that's Naomi, my mother-in-law. Now, I'm cool with family stuff, but Naomi was a pro at pushing my buttons and making me doubt myself. It felt like I was trapped in an endless loop of her nagging and insults. Yikes, right? But hey, love can make you do crazy stuff, and I love Tina like crazy. So I put up with all the Naomi drama and kept my cool. I was determined not to let her toxic vibes mess up our relationship. Tina was totally worth it. As time went by, though, I noticed a change in Tina. She started acting distant and withdrawn. It was obvious that something wasn't right. So one evening, while we were snuggled up on the couch, I finally got the courage to talk to her about it. Hey, babe, I've noticed you've been a bit distant lately. Is everything all right? So there I was, sitting with Tina, and I could see she was struggling. Her eyes looked all frustrated and sad at the same time. After a moment of hesitation, she let out a sigh and started talking. Steve, I love you, but I can't help but feel like something is missing in our relationship. Man, my mind was going crazy, trying to figure out what she was saying. It was like a tornado inside my head, trying to make sense of her words. I racked my brain for potential problems, but for the life of me, I couldn't figure out what she was talking about. So then I asked, what do you mean, babe? I thought we were solid. Steve, it's just, I don't feel the same respect for you as I used to. I miss the days when we were on top, when the money was flowing, and we had it all. I know it sounds shallow, but it's how I feel. I was used to a certain lifestyle, and now... I don't know. What the hell? Her words hit me hard. I'm not going to lie. I couldn't believe it had come to this point. Was our love all about money and success? It made me so mad, hurt, and confused all at once. Are you kidding me, babe? Money isn't everything. Our love should be about more than just how fat my paycheck is. We've got something real and unique here, something that goes way beyond material stuff. What are you talking about? I know, Steve, but I can't help the way I feel. I miss the security, the lifestyle we had before. It was like a back and forth of emotions, love and frustration all mixed up. But no matter how much we talked, we couldn't seem to get on the same page. As the night dragged on, it hit me that our marriage was hanging by a thread. I couldn't handle her shallowness. Like, seriously. I didn't even know who I was talking to anymore. Love is about supporting and understanding each other through thick and thin, you know? Everything went downhill after that. Over time... I got fed up with Tina's materialistic mindset. Love changes and I realized my feelings for her were different now. The spark we once had was gone and money or things couldn't fill that void. With that new realization, I stopped holding back when it came to Naomi's mistreatment. Oh boy, was I ready to fight back and let me tell you, things got intense. We'd end up screaming at each other whenever we crossed paths. We were all sitting around the dinner table. It was supposed to be a peaceful family dinner. Ha! Peace was nowhere to be found. The tension was so thick you could cut it with a knife and it felt like everyone was waiting for a huge explosion. Naomi took a sip of her wine. Her eyes fixated on me. Steve, dear, I'm sorry to sound so crass, but... When are you going to get your act together? I don't see any progress in your career, and it's time you step up and provide for my daughter. Well, I see the apple doesn't fall far from the tree. In case you didn't get the memo, Naomi, love and respect aren't things that can be bought and sold. I may not have stacks of cash, but I've got a heart full of love and dedication. That stuff is worth way more than any amount of money. Isn't that what truly matters? 
And it's not like we're swimming in poverty either. You all need to grow up. Oh, she was really mad after I said that. Oh, that's rich coming from you. You're the one who needs to grow up, Steve. Love won't pay the bills. Love won't pay for groceries. Yeah, love is important, but come on, Steve, don't be delusional. In this economy, a man is nothing if he doesn't have more than enough money. Our fights got crazy intense, each one full of bitterness and resentment. We were throwing words at each other like daggers tearing apart our already wonky relationship. I won't get into all the nitty gritty, but it was way out of control. I might have said some seriously harsh stuff that even makes sailors blush, but I didn't care. I was tired of her crap. One day, Tina took me aside and I could see she was so confused and hurt. Her eyes said it all. Honestly, I was surprised at her confusion. She should have seen this coming with the way she and her mother were treating me. Steve, why are you treating my mom this way? She's only looking out for our best interests. You need to stop acting so rude. It's getting out of hand. I took a deep breath, stealing myself for what I was about to say. Tina, I gotta be real with you now. The truth is, I don't feel the same love for you anymore. I mean, who are we kidding? Our marriage has turned into this messed up fight over money and lack of respect, and it seems like we won't ever get on the same page. I think we should get a divorce. Steve, you can't be serious. We've built a life together. What about our dreams? What about me? Tina, dreams change. People change. I can't keep living a lie, pretending that everything is fine when it's not. We both deserve to find our happiness. And since I can't provide that to you, I think it's best we just call it quits. I hope there's no bad blood. It's just, I can't handle this anymore. And just like that, the bomb dropped. It hit us like a ton of bricks. Everything just fell apart. Our marriage just crumbled, leaving behind a mess of broken promises and shattered hopes. We had to face the truth that it was time to go our separate ways and find our happiness. Tina and I, well, let's just say things had taken a turn for the worse between us. The tension was thick enough to cut with a steak knife and every interaction felt like a dance on broken glass. So we both agreed that it would be best if I packed my bags and found a new place to crash while the divorce proceedings unfolded. Trust me, folks, it was the smartest move we could make to avoid any more unnecessary awkwardness. We needed some breathing space, a chance to untangle ourselves from the mess we had created and figure out how to move forward. It wasn't an easy decision, but sometimes you have to take a step back to gain clarity, right? So there I was, living in my own little slice of freedom, separate from Tina, when out of the blue I received a message that turned my world upside down. It was a message from a distant relative, a great uncle I hadn't heard from in years. The message stated that his wife, who was my direct relative, had sadly passed away and she had left behind a whopping inheritance of $2 million just for me. Now, you might be thinking, Steve, this sounds like some elaborate scam. And trust me, I had my doubts too. My initial reaction was pure disbelief. I hadn't been in contact with my family for so long. I'm ashamed to admit that I didn't even know if they were still alive. So naturally, I questioned the realness of the message. I fired back a response demanding proof, thinking this was some sort of cruel prank or a scam artist trying to get their hands on my hard-earned cash. But you know what? He provided the evidence. The official documents, the legalities, everything checked out. I couldn't believe my eyes. It was as if fate had thrown a curveball my way and I had hit a home run. The weight of this sudden fortune hit me like a ton of bricks and I found myself dropping to my knees, sobbing uncontrollably. I mean, think about it. I was getting by, earning a decent amount, but still I was feeling a bit suffocated by financial stress every now and then, as one normally does. And now, in one fell swoop... I had the chance to change everything. I literally became an overnight millionaire. The emotions that washed over me were immeasurable to say the least. 
I was overwhelmed with a mix of emotions from shock to disbelief to sheer gratitude. Word travels fast in a small town, y'all, and before I knew it, news of my impending millionaire status spread like wildfire. It seemed like everyone and their mother was suddenly interested in my life. People I hadn't talked to in ages were coming out of the woodwork looking for their own slice of the pie. Amidst all the craziness and the tension, I needed some time to really think about what this meant for me. Money can be a double-edged sword, you know. It can bring happiness, but it can also mess things up. So I had to be careful about how it would affect my life. Sure, the idea of being financially free was tempting, but I knew from experience that money doesn't guarantee happiness. Hold on tight, guys, because here comes the twist. I was just doing my thing, enjoying my freedom in a separate house when out of nowhere, I got a call from none other than my ex-mother-in-law. Naomi wasted no time and got straight to the point. Steve, I hear you're about to become a millionaire, is that true? I could practically hear the dollar signs dancing in her eyes over the phone. Naturally, I was skeptical. Oh, come on, Naomi, are you telling me you're calling just because of my upcoming wealth? Unsurprisingly, Naomi acted like nothing was wrong and invited me over for a family dinner. Can you believe it? She said she missed her dear sister-in-law and thought it'd be nice to have one last get-together before we split for good. I roll. I mean, come on. I had already told both Tina and Naomi that our relationship was beyond fixing. Divorce was happening and there was no going back. So, of course... I just chuckled at how ridiculous it all sounded and gave my reply. Naomi, let's be real here. Tina and I are getting divorced. Why would you want to throw a family dinner? So there I was, turning down Naomi's invite to the dinner, but she just wouldn't take no for an answer. She was playing the sentimental card like a pro, trying to get me to join them. She made it sound like this dinner would be all nostalgic and full of cherished memories. I could practically see her sneaky grin through the phone, knowing she had hooked me with that bait. It was a tough call, you know. Part of me wanted to avoid all the drama and manipulation, but another part wanted closure and to face that toxicity head on. In the end, curiosity got the best of me. Against my gut feeling, I reluctantly agreed to attend the family dinner. I just couldn't resist seeing how far Naomi would go to get her way. So I showed up to the dinner... And it's like I'm some kind of superstar. Tina's whole extended family is all over me, clapping and showering me with attention. It's like I hit the lottery or something. Well, technically I did, I guess, depending on how you look at it. And then there was Naomi smirking like a cat that got the cream. She walks over, putting on that fake sweet voice of hers. Oh boy, I knew I was in for something crazy. Well, well, well. Steve, my boy, look at you. Quite the catch, aren't you? I could smell the deceit from a mile away. But I didn't play along, raising an eyebrow to show I wasn't buying her act. All right, folks, hold the phone, because Tina, my ex-wife, stormed in like she owned the place. Our eyes met and something was going on, though I couldn't quite figure it out. Was it regret? Longing? Who knows, but I wasn't falling for her mind games. We all gathered around this fancy dining table feeling like some messed up royal family. The air was thick with fake smiles as we dug into a feast fit for kings. Everyone was toasting and chatting politely, but I could see the hidden agendas lurking underneath it all. The taste of sweet revenge lingered as I navigated through small talk and phony niceties. As the night went on, I somehow became the center of attention, the life of the party. People hung on my every word, laughing like I was some kind of comedy genius. It was crazy how money changed things, turning me into the golden child. But deep down, I knew it was all smoke and mirrors. Money revealed people's true colors, and I could see greed and envy creeping in. But amidst all the glitz and glam, there was this bitterness creeping in. This newfound fortune felt hollow, reminding me of how shallow human interactions could be. I couldn't help but wonder if it was all worth it. 
All right, now get ready for the juicy part. Naomi, that conniving mastermind, cornered me in the bathroom like a predator. She had this sly smile on her face as she pitched her grand plan of reconciliation. Steve, darling, I just wanted to say, Tina really misses you, and I miss you too. Oh boy, here we go again with the sweet talk. She started going on and on about how the distance had cleared up some things for Tina and her, and they all of a sudden realized that I was actually good for Tina. But little did Naomi know I wasn't about to fall for her tricks. I saw right through her desperate act, all the sugar-coated words and false promises. It was time to turn the tables, to play my own game of manipulation. So I played along, nodding and feigning interest in her remarks. So instead of telling her to kick rocks, I had this mischievous idea. I decided to get back together with Tina, but with a twist. I wanted to take control for once, you know? Make a grand announcement that would catch everyone off guard. I told Naomi to gather the whole family and bring them to the dining table. She thought she had won, but little did she know about the master plan I had brewing in my head as she hurried off, I couldn't help but smirk to myself. It was going to be epic. So there I was, sitting at the table, enjoying all the curious glances and whispers from my ex-in-laws. They had no clue what was coming. And then the big moment arrived. Naomi led everyone back to the table, all excited. I stood up, took a deep breath and raised my glass, grabbing everyone's attention. Ladies and gentlemen, I have an announcement to make. Everyone hung on to every word I said, practically hovering off their seats. I know you're all thinking about my relationship with Tina and whether or not there's a chance for us to rekindle what we had. Well, I'm excited to announce that I'm single. The room was filled with disappointed sighs and confused murmurs. They low-key thought I'd give in to their pleas and change my mind about the divorce like we'd all live happily ever after. But I wasn't falling for it. I couldn't ignore what was going on, the fake concern they all had ever since they heard about my newfound fortune. So I looked around the table, locking eyes with each one of them with a firm stare, silently letting them know that they were stupid for thinking I'd ever come back. Let's not forget, just a few short months ago, you all either treated me like garbage or couldn't care less about me. So forgive me if I find it hard to believe your sudden change of heart. Naomi and Tina went into full-on begging mode, trying to convince me that they were totally genuine about wanting me back in the family. They were all apologies and promises of change, begging me to give them another shot. But you know what? I wasn't falling for their tricks, and I had had it with all their games, manipulations, and fake acts of kindness. Enough was enough. I'm done with this whole damn family. Despite my shouting, they try their best to drag me back in, giving me their so-called genuine reasons for wanting me back. But like I said, I wasn't falling for it. I walked away from that house, their cries fading into the background as I took off. It was a moment that changed everything, a turning point in my life. I was finally free from their toxic grip, ready to pave my own way without their interference. And as I stepped out into the cool night breeze, a sense of freedom washed over me. I took a deep breath, savoring the sweet taste of independence. It was a mix of emotions, bitter and sweet, but it was a victory for me, I'll have to admit. From that point on, I made a promise to myself. I'd reclaim my life and pursue happiness on my terms with people who genuinely love me for me. So that's how my story goes. After leaving that messy dinner behind, I returned to my own place, patiently waiting for the inheritance money to come through. The story should have ended there, right? Unfortunately, no. Naomi and Tina just wouldn't leave me alone. They kept calling and texting, desperate to get me back. They promised to change, to do better, or whatever that meant. I had no time for their empty words and manipulative games, though. I had enough. So I blocked and deleted their numbers, cutting ties with the toxic past that had kept me captive for far too long. Finally, the day came when the money was officially mine. It was just as overwhelming as the day I first got the news. 
With all that wealth, I knew I had to make a smart move. I watched all those horror stories of people who lost their money after winning the lottery, and I was determined to be one of the guys who actually used it wisely. This small town wasn't the right place for a guy with that kind of fortune. I mean, having loads of cash can attract all kinds of bad attention and enemies. So I packed my bags and said goodbye to the familiar streets and faces that used to bug me. I left without a trace, starting a whole new chapter in my life. I changed my name and moved to a different state far away from my past. There, I found a fresh start, and man, it felt liberating to have all those possibilities ahead of me. Now and then, I can't help but be curious, so I check out Tina's Instagram and let me tell you it's a trip. She's trying so hard to find a sugar daddy or something to fill the void I left behind. It's kind of funny to see how desperate she's become. Chasing after materialistic stuff in a hopeless quest for happiness? Her first traps are trashy, but I wish her all the best. As for me, I'm just chilling. I've come to realize that true happiness isn't found in all that shallow wealth or the messed up relationship that used to haunt me. I found peace in my newfound independence, living a life that's free from their toxic grip. So, take it from me, guys. Money isn't everything. Sure, it can get you fancy cars and big mansions, but if that's all you're worried about, then your life won't be worth living.